So the library has a lot of uh, interesting things that aren't immediately obvious. Obviously, it's a very interesting place, just on the appearance. For uh, people like Brainiacs, they could appreciate it. But this was, this was a research library. And I don't know how many of you have ever done live research in libraries. It's a pretty arduous task. But, uh, Edison wanted to keep on top of the latest work around the world. So he kept a library of patents around the world. He kept on top of current events by uh, having subscriptions to all the technical journals of the day. He had a full-time librarian. Uh, and he did a lot of work here. He greeted people, famous people, uh, industrialists who wanted to do deals with them, uh, business deals and so forth. He would have them wait out here where you just were, and then they should be ushered in. Also had his uh, laying in state here. Uh, he laid in state here for three days when he, after he died in 1931. And uh, there were lines miles long from his body. Um, so around the room you can see a lot of interesting exhibits of his life. But a lot of these pictures and so forth were here during his life. Uh, the desk, for instance, is as it was in the last decade of his life. That's pretty much the way it looked with all original papers and so forth uh, for the last few, few months of his life. Because he was still working up until about, please don't use a flash in here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, he was working up until just a few months before his death. And then he, uh, got, he, got, he got worse fast. It's uh, thought that he died of complications from sort of undiagnosed diabetes or minor diabetes. Or, um, some of the vintage photos, and when they when they renovated this room, they went by a lot of vintage photos. Now the desk, the famous desk, and it's famous because it was closed on his death, the day of his death, by his father, by his son, and it was left locked for 16 years. And then on the 100th anniversary of his birth, in 1947, they reopened it, and in a big ceremony in 1947. And interestingly enough. Uh, this kiosk here has a picture that the, the desk was reopened with his wife, and his wife died that same year. So his wife actually died on the 100th anniversary of his birth, uh, which is kind of interesting. But that was his second wife, Mina. His first wife died uh, at a very early age uh, due to one of the diseases of the day, uh, I forget what, typhoid or something like that. Not typhoid, uh, some, something like that, a complication of measles maybe. I'm just a volunteer, so I don't know every fact. I know a few facts. Uh, now, since everybody here is a brainiac, they should be able to find out. <laughs> Does anybody see, see the movie theater in here? Yep. Uh, is it the screen right there? Yes, the screen on rolls. And there's a projection booth on the second floor here. Because in the earliest days of his developments in motion pictures, uh, people didn't think it would go anywhere. So he actually would, would give demonstration movies to potential investors. It wasn't for Friday Night at the Movies with Edison and Popcorn. Yeah. Um, that's the, the earliest days of, of motion pictures and the fact that he had to like try to convince people to invest in this. His book ended with his famous award from the Academy of Motion Pictures right here next to the statue of uh, Morpheus. Now that uh, that's signed by all the famous directors and actors of the day. In 1929 that award was given to him. And uh, it's, I always say this sort of tongue in cheek, it's, it's, uh, they're thanking him for making them all millionaires, or however, however many people on that are assigned are millionaires, and forming that whole, whole way of life, because without motion pictures, who knows what they would have A um, couple of places you'll see photos of the, of the uh, production buildings. Up there, notably, uh, that shows a picture of, of all the uh, production facilities of which this, these labs were built in 1887. And it's pretty much unchanged. All the buildings are unchanged from 1887. But the production facilities for the various Edison companies grew up around these research labs. And so at the peak, there was almost 10,000 employees working in West Orange at these various buildings. There's one building left, which is on this side of the research lab, and it's the old data now that old battery plant, they were going to turn into condos, but I don't, who knows what's going to happen now. But that battery plant was making batteries until the 60s. You could, you could walk into an auto parts store in 1962 and say, I want an Edison brand battery, I want the best. And they'd say, OK, 
Okay, there's the nest and ran down. So uh, that was that was still the uh, highest quality battery even in 1962. And what's interesting is the battery that Edison had, he perfected the nickel iron battery. Did anybody read up since you're radiant? Did anybody read up on the battery research? That's one of the more notable things. That's one of the more notable things in one aspect. That it was, he was so far ahead in his battery work that the battery was basically the battery design and the chemistry was unchanged from when he perfected it in the early 19 teens. The same chemistry, the same internal electrostructure was still being done in the uh, 1970s. So he perfected the nickel iron alkaline battery. And they found one of his batteries uh, that was sitting in somebody's storage, in somebody's basement or something. It was 40 years old and still had a charge. Wow. Because it used, it, it went away from acid. It was using alkaline. And he, 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 he's the one that really developed the idea of having an alkaline electro rather than an acid electro. All the batteries up to then had been sulfuric acid. And uh, his chemistry actually had very little losses off the electrodes. So he didn't have, the problem with lead acid batteries is the, the oxidized products fall to the bottom of the battery. You, you can actually take your car battery, you want to sign your place it, and you're from Manhattan, probably not a lot of you have cars. Mm -hmm. Although when I lived in Manhattan, at one point I had two cars, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, I kept them in my garage in the 60s. Uh, Anyway, you can you you can shake out your battery, and shake the sludge out of the bottom, and that that actually rejuvenates a lot of lead acid batteries. You place electrode, and then you're good for another five years. Um, but getting back to Edison, uh, on the, and coming back to batteries, on the top there's a picture there. And if, if any of you have good eyesight, you can see it's a whole bunch of like uh, carriages, and that's that's actually connected with the electric uh, his electric battery work. Because he was trying to come up with a practical electrical car, and he did, but he was just a few years too late. The, the internal combustion had sort of gotten gotten the momentum going, and um, that picture up there illustrates. Uh, it's a picture of how many gasoline and horse-drawn carriages can be replaced by just a few electric cars in terms of carrying capacity. Uh, that's actually taken on Boston Commons in Boston. That's a picture of that was a publicity photo. Uh, interestingly enough, some of you may know this, uh, that Ford worked briefly for Edison. Not directly. Ford didn't work at this facility. He worked at the Detroit Edison Company. And uh, the people at the Detroit Edison Company uh, found, figured out right away that Ford was a real gung-ho guy. And they promoted him, and they, were gonna, they wanted to make him superintendent. He kept using the company facilities to do experimentations on his cars, on his experimental <laughs> cars. And uh, at one point, the, the head of the company in Detroit came up to him and said, I'll make you superintendent of the whole com of the Detroit company, uh, but that means you won't have time for your, uh, your experiments in cars. You'll have to choose. And Ford said, no, I'm just going to go out on my own and perfect my car. And uh, quickly, like, it was still, it wasn't the turn of the century yet, Edison already found out that Ford, you know, Ford became big right away. Yeah? And Edison encouraged Ford. Edison was sort of an unofficial mentor to Ford, believe it or not. So Edison, even though Ford was more or less somewhat a competitor in one of the fields that Edison was working in, Edison said, well, you know, I'll encourage you in your inventions because I have so many other things I'm working on. So, that's Even though it killed his electric car. What's that? Even though it killed his electric car. It kind of, there were other people working electric cars, but yeah, it, it lessened the need for batteries. I mean, that would have been another, it was a big industry for Edison, but it would have been a much bigger industry, obviously. And if the, and if Edison had been about 10 years earlier with his chemistry, if he had perfected his, his, uh, his alkali battery 10 years earlier, the whole world would have been different. We were driving around electric cars. <laughs> so that was an unfortunate accident of history. You, things that actually come true, like say the motion picture, motion picture industry, that you can see the fruits of it. But things that missed by a few years, unfortunately, <laughs> the world would have been a completely different place. Can you talk about um, yeah. his living